Hi guys, uh, my name is Meul Chandelia and I'm back again today with uh, another of the lesser known legal topics, uh, which is space law. Yeah, sorry about that. So guys, uh, as I told you in my previous videos, I'll be discussing about some legal topics which are not very much discussed or uh, which are not very much prominent uh, in, in the legal fraternity of our country, but yet they need there need to be discussions about it because we may call them the legal subjects of the future and one such topic that i'll be <coughs> sorry one such one such subject that i'll be taking up today is space law uh, so there is a difference between international aviation law or aviation law as you might call it and space law now why do we require laws in sp space are that uh, since the uh, inception of mankind we have uh, we have uh, you know measured leaps and bounds now we are sending rockets into space we are exploring other planets we are exploring the moons of other planets uh, like recently you might have heard about the cassini mission of nasa which uh, went to saturn and that was one of the most prominent missions that mankind ever sent into outer space we are actually now also looking towards asteroids and now we are also planning to mine asteroids mine them for resources uh, moreover we are also by we i mean the mankind in general all the countries combined all the major space agencies so recently elon musk said that uh, very shortly we'll start uh, suborbital flights or space orbital fli flights that is basically the commercial flights from our planet to the moon, from our planet to the Mars. And pretty soon uh, we'll also start colonizing Mars as well. We'll start sending humans to Mars. We'll start colonizing that planet. So when so much activities are actually taking place in the outer space, we do need some laws in place to keep these countries in check. Otherwise, there can be some serious, serious problems. Now, with that being said, I'll just straight away come to the basics of space law. I'll first start uh, with uh, what are the major treaties and international conventions in space law. And uh, after that, I'll come to the five major basic principles of space law. In this video, I'll be only discussing uh, this much. And after that, if you have any other queries or doubts, as I, all, as I told you all before, please feel free to reach out to me. I can personally hand out notes to you in this subject because this is something which I take very very seriously and uh, this uh, as I also said in my earlier videos both these subjects aviation law and space law are something uh, something which are my fortes personally and uh, I aspire to make my career in this as well so with that being said let us start with today's video I'll be sharing my screen now All right I hope it's, yeah, yeah, now, <clears throat> so we'll start with Outer Space Treaty 1967. At the moment, there are 105 ratifications, but 25 signatures. So guys, this is the oldest uh, treaty with regards to space law that is there in place, but the mo most major, major treaty that is there most of the principles and fundamentals of space law actually uh, flow from the outer space treaty so far there have been 100, 105 uh, ratifications plus 25 signatures so as i told you in my previous video by ratification you means that uh, you inculcate the principle of that treaty into your national laws in india you drew, in india it is done through article 253 of the constitution so yeah uh, the here, here are the basics about Outer Space Treaty, the OST, uh, it is also called OST in short. The OST sets the cons constitutive foundations for all exploration and use of outer space. It is the broadest of all the space specific treaties and the later latter space specific treaties can be seen as supplements to the Outer Space Treaty. So basically guys, as I told you, this is the most important uh, space treaty that is there. It is the broadest of them all and all the other treaties that have come after it basically flow from the outer space treaty as well basically they, they have come to supplement the outer space treaty in general after that we have the rescue and return agreement of 1968 uh, which has 95 ratifications and 24 signatures 
Now, this agreement provides for the rescue and return of astronauts in distress and of space objects to their launching authorities. One thing to be noted here is, guys, um, there is no appropriation of any space objects that come from space. By appropriation, I mean no one can own any kind of space objects. For example, if NASA brings back any sample from the moon, it cannot be owned by the United States of America. It, it is to be shared with the whole mankind. But the problem is there are some loopholes in the moon agreement and the outer space treaty and countries like USA have actually found their way through those loopholes. And now uh, USA has actually come up with their own national space legislation. Uh, they actually came up with it in 2015 itself. So. In that national space legislation, the USA has given itself the right to appropriate space objects to itself. So basically, they can own anything that is there in the outer space, and they can do so with the virtue of the national of their national space le legislation that they have come out with. Uh, but the good news is India is also actually planning to come out with uh, our own national space legislation. The bill is already there in the parliament. It just needs to be confirmed by both the houses and then it will become a law. That is why, guys, it is also said that international law is like a toothless tiger. There are treaties, there are conventions in place, but uh, hardly any country uh, seriously follows them. Most of the countries, even after ratifying those treaties or conventions, they just find their way around uh, them and they just uh, make their own national uh, laws, which which are in derogation with those international treaties or uh, conventions. All right, let's move on. Let's come on to Liability Convention of 1972, which has 94 ratification plus 20 signatures. The Liability Convention defines the circumstances in which a launching state is liable for a space object deals with the case of multiple launching sites in respect of the one space object, describes how a claim might be made within a one year time frame and provides for the establishment of an ad hoc claims commission to settle down claims between two or more states. I'll read it again. It basically defines the circumstances in which a launching state is liable for a space object. It deals with cases of multiple launching sites in response to one uh, in, this, in respect of the one space object it describes how a claim might be made within a one year time frame and provides for the establishment of an ad hoc claims commission so basically under the liability con uh, convention a, tribu a tribunal or an ad hoc claims commission can be set up which may dispute uh, which may settle the dispute between two contesting parties now what kind of disputes they may be the disputes uh, again as i told you the disputes may be related to the appropriation of space objects for example, if China brings a sample back and uh, doesn't share it with the rest of the world, and if India objects to China that how can you appropriate a space, a property from outer space to yourself? Now, such kind of dispute are to be settled by the ad hoc claims commission that is set uh, in the liability convention. Or the dispute might be related to, for example, if India launches a rocket and uh, that rocket gets blown up in the atmosphere and the pieces of that rocket fall on the Chinese territory. Now China will raise an issue with India that India is liable to pay for the damages. That dispute has to be settled by the Ad Hoc Claims Commission, which is set up under the Liability uh, Convention. Next is the Registration Convention of 1975 with uh, 63 ratification and 4 signatures. The registration convention provides for the registration of space objects by the or one of the launching uh, states in respect of a space object. Basically, whatever object that you are launching into space, you have to get it registered in the country from where it is being launched. For example, if India launches uh, PSLV or GSLV, PSLV stands for Polar Satellite Launch Vehicles, GSLV stands for Geo Satellite Launch Vehicles. So if India is launching a PSLV or a GSLV mission, that PSLV or GSLV has to be registered in India as per the registration convention. India is also a party to this convention. Now, the Moon Agreement, again, one of the most, one of the most basic and important agreements of all time. This agreement had only 18 ratification and four signatures. Why I am calling this agreement important is that because it gave the common heritage of mankind principle, which basically states that whatever 
discoveries that we are making today whatever space uh, explorations that we are making today is to be preserved for the future generations and is to be shared by the whole mankind in general so australia is one of the only 18 states party to the moon agreement it covers not just the moon but all celestial bodies it expands on several articles of the outer space treaty including article 1 which describes the exploration and use of outer space as the province of humanity now guys don't get confused there is a difference between both these principle that is common heritage of mankind and province of mankind uh, i'll also discuss about the differences between both these principle in another video because it's a very important topic under the subject space law and it actually needs to be deliberated upon uh, anyway let's move on province of humanity on a basis of equality plus the related provision in article 2 that no state may claim sovereignty over any part of outer space very very important guys keep this in mind including the moon and other celestial bodies and article 4 which significantly limits military activities on the moon and other celestial bodies the moon agreement provides extra detail about the specific mode of cooperative use and most significantly foreshadows an international regime to be settled among uh, state parties for exploration of the national resources of the moon and other celestial bodies the problem with the moon agreement was that uh, there were so many loopholes and it, it it was basically an extension of the outer space treaty as well so most of the countries if i have to say it bluntly they found the moon agreement to be useless they thought that if they would sign the moon agreement it would be like signing the outer space treaty all over again because the provisions in some way are pretty similar and the moon agreement is just filled with so many loopholes it has vague definitions it the there is no specific criteria for defining things under the moon agreement they have been just defined randomly the like the definition of celestial bodies itself is pretty vague uh, the uh, definition of sovereignty under the moon agreement is so vague so that is why uh, not many countries uh, signed this agreement and many of them actually chose to back out now uh, moving on coming to basic principle of international space law here i'll be discussing about five major most important and the most basic principles that are there in international space law first of them all states are free to use and explore outer space pretty simple since outer space belongs to no one so all states are free to use and explore outer space the same has been mentioned under article 1 of ost it provides outer space including the moon and other celestial bodies shall be free for exploration and use by all states without discrimination of any kind on a basis of equality and in accordance with international law and there shall be free access to all areas of celestial bodies no limitations can be presumed every state can develop and use rocket technology and satellite technology notwithstanding that the rockets could conceivably be conceivably be used as missiles and the satellites used for spying however such use must be in accordance with international law including the charter of the united nations which prohibits the threat or use of force against other states as per article 2 clause 4 of the charter of the un so charter of the un don't get confused by it it was basically the charter under which the united nations itself was established and its article 2 clause 4 pro prohibits the threat or use of force against any other state yeah i know you might be confused that uh, if there is a complete prohibition or threat or use of force against any other state then why do so many countries have such large armies we'll come to that we'll have to discuss it in some other video in which i'll be exclusively discussing about the united nations its uh, structure its formation the reasons for formation etc the exploration and use of outer space is for the benefit of all the countries this is principle second again it has been provided under article 1 of the outer space treaty that uh, whatever exploration or whatever uses of outer space are being made including the moon and other celestial bodies shall be carried out for the benefit and interest of all countries irrespective of their degree of economic or scientific development it is not clear the extent to which a space activity by a national or one state must provide some benefit to other states as opposed to benefit only for the state involved in the activity but the practice of state tends to suggest that it is a very low threshold if there is any threshold at all now the third principle the delimitation of the outer space has not been truly defined yes it is true we do not know from where actually the outer space starts there is there are still debates going on about about this 
the most commonly accepted uh, area is the 100 kilometers above earth is the place where our atmosphere ends and the outer space starts but again it is being disputed by many countries so the topic of legal delimitation between the upper limit of air space and the lower limit of outer space has been on the agenda of the committee on the peaceful uses of outer space also known as the copas since its inception in 1957 but many states have resisted attempts to provide a definition nevertheless it is considered clear that international space law applies to objects in orbit and beyond in orbit as in objects which are orbiting our planet like the satellites and beyond the orbit like moon or uh, other planets etc that it applies to things <clears throat> that may be described as space objects including rockets from at least the moment of int uh, intentional ignition it applies to astronauts and it applies to any conduct that may be described as a national activity in outer space now here are the last two principles all relevant international laws applies to outer space not just the outer space treaties this has been provided under article 3 of the outer space treaty it basically states that uh, state parties to the treaty shall carry on activities uh, to explore the outer space including the moon and other celestial bodies in accordance with international law not just the space treaties but in accordance with the international law per se as in the international law which is existing right here on earth All, all right which also includes the charter of the united nations thus outer space is subject to application to the broad body of international law generally which is again very true the outer space cannot be covered by space treaties only it has to be covered by other international law as well this would include for example the inherent right of national self defense recognized in article 51 of the charter of the un and therefore defensive military activities in outer space would be lawful the conduct of those activities would be subject to the relevant elements of the laws of armed conflict now you would wonder how would one conduct defensive military activities in outer space then i would give you an example recently some of you might have read that uh, india actually knocked down our own satellite with a missile with a surface to air missile and we became the fourth country in the world to do so currently at the moment there is usa russia china and india these four countries actually have the capability to capability to knock down satellites from the orbit using a surface to air missile also known as sam in short all right that, that this is all uh, this is it for this video guys i'll stop sharing my screen now yeah this is it for this video uh, for the sake of brevity i'll have to end it here but of course as i told you before feel free to reach out to me if you want to discuss more about this subject if you feel like you want to pursue this subject uh, as your career and uh, i'll give you suggestions i'll tell you what to do and yeah of course uh, stay safe guys please do not go out take care of yourself and your family and please 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 subscribe to this channel please like this video if you found it to be useful and share this video with your friends we would be very glad and thank you for your time guys that would be all